Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to the ECM podcast. I'm Caroline Fontagneux, and I'm very happy to host this series that will take you behind the scenes of new music on ECM Records. In this new episode, I'm meeting saxophone player, composer, band leader, and raga master Odette Tsua. For this interview, we met in Brooklyn, where Odette lives, to discuss his new album produced by Manfred Eicher, Isabella. Odette talks about love, ragas, rhythms, and inspirations. First of all, I wanted to know how Odette Tsua was feeling about his music a few days after coming back from tour. What I really love about the unfolding process with this particular band is that it's never the same. And actually unfolding is a, is a really good word because it keeps uh, changing every night even though the material is actually pretty uh, distilled, uh, pretty, um, you know, specific in the way that it's uh, written. And um, I think that it's, it's really saying something about Nitai and Petros and Jonathan that we find ourselves in such different environments. Like I really have to ask myself sometimes which song are we even playing right now? Because we have gone so far off what the composition suggested, and I mean that in the best of ways, that I, I, I'm in a new place, you know? And that definitely happened every night. Uh, I think uh, Nitai, his name should actually be Land of Pure Imagination. That should be his like first, middle, last name. And then he should be like, a.k.a. <laughs> Nitai Hoshkowitz. <laughs> and, and same thing for Petros and Jonathan, their contribution for the music. It's just really... Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be part of this group that is creating this thing that to me is larger than the sum of its parts. I, I have never been part of something similar. So I'm very, um, I'm very happy with that. I was asking you about unfolding and not evolving because I think you'd agree with me that the idea behind playing this music on stage is not going from a point A to a point B. It's just like it's growing, it's unfolding mm -hmm. really. It's it's more than just evolving. Would would you agree with that? I think so. What you're saying makes me think a little bit of the composition itself, which is set in this musical idea that is called Raga, right? So um, not to delve too much into that right now, but a Raga is very much like a person in that it is fixed on the one hand, but it's completely infinite and uh, able to unfold in all kinds of different ways. So a person, like we are meeting here now and we're talking to each other, and I recognize that you are you, Hopefully you recognize that I am me. Um, but, you know, if we meet tomorrow, I would still recognize that it's you, but you're going to say different things. And different things are going to unfold. So a raga is, is very much like that. And uh, actually, this concept has been at the center of my uh, work for a long time, but never like this, because the, the portrait idea, the, the portraiture aspect of this album really allowed me to focus on this more than ever before. So when we're talking about how it unfolds every night, this is what it connects for me too, because uh, that's actually what's supposed to happen. You're playing the same material, uh, even in the Indian classical music context. It's this uh, creature but you have to be with this creature tonight and see where it goes. That's the ideal situation. Place of Indian music is huge. 
huge in your inspiration, in your career, and in your music. Uh, where does that come from? <laughs> Why? How come? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I think that when I was growing up uh, in Israel, I was, you know, uh, surrounded by all of these different musical possibilities. Not only in Israel, but just living in the digital age, seeing whatever it is that comes up on the internet, being suddenly exposed to so many different types of music, and I had a hard time sort of making a choice and saying, okay, jazz is my language, or uh, brass bands from the Balkans, that's my music, or flamenco, or like different things that I fell in love with. But why did you have to make a choice? Because I'm very stubborn. Mm. <laughs> I really... That, that You're right, a lot of my colleagues didn't, and they created a certain uh, collage, let's say, where they focus on something, but they also have, you know, these these guests of other music, musical types. I think that I really cared about finding an answer to this question of, of like, what is the musical phenomenon? What is it? What is this thing? And uh, is it just all of these separate things? Which is fine, maybe it is. Or is there anything that goes like a hidden thread through all of the musical traditions and connects them? And uh, since I wasn't uh, able to uh, compromise in this way, I, uh, I really had to sort of find an answer to this question, or at least try. Yeah. And I think that in Indian classical music, I felt that uh, there is a sort of um, uh, almost a laboratory of sound, something that is almost scientific in its attitude. Um, and we've talked about this once or twice, but... Um, you take a certain frequency, a certain note, and then another note, and you really study that interval. And um, I think that I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it like this at the time, but it gave me a window into the musical phenomenon itself. And uh, after studying this music for, let's say, the better part of a decade, coming back and looking at other things, like for example the blues, I was able to see, at least with this perspective, that the blues is 100% a raga. At least if you put your raga goggles on, hmm. you can't arrive at any other conclusion. Because it is exactly that, what we just said, absolutely distinct, in the sense that you hear one phrase of the blues, you know that's the blues. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's infinite. You can write a million different songs in that one type of uh, raga. Hmm. So it's remarkable because it's a whole genre of music that is based on one raga, just one, but it's so magical and so uh, extraordinary in its possibilities of expression that it gave rise to a whole genre of music. In Indian classical music, we have thousands of ragas that are all representing you know, a certain feeling, emotion, mood, character, yeah. mood, and we study them like that. Um, however, that being said, uh, the blues is exactly all of those things, you know. It is microtonal music. It's all about the relationships between the notes in the scale. There is a scale, but it's not a scale, it's more than a scale. It's like a person. If you hear one phrase of the blues, you would say, oh, it's this, it's this person that I know. But at the same time, tomorrow you would hear another phrase and, and it could be completely different. So, um, all of that to say that I just um, couldn't live in this world without finding out whether there is anything consistent or universal to this language that we call music. And I, and I think that in Indian classical music, I was able to explore some of those things.
you're talking a lot about the blues and the way you connected to ragas and, and, the, and all of your influences, really. And I think it's interesting because there's a lot. I hear a lot of blues in your music. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about classical Indian music, but I hear a lot of blues, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of like influenced from the blues. Is it accurate? Like, would, would you? Yeah. Do you listen to a lot of blues? Did you listen to a lot of blues? I, I do listen to some. What fascinates me most, though, is if I can point to something and say, this is just a miracle that shows up here and also shows up over there. In the sense that, let me put it another way. When I was growing up and trying to tackle these things, there were already a lot of musicians that were trying to mix this music with that music. And that always really bothered me because on a certain level I felt like something is already uh, universal, something is already joint between these traditions, if you look closely enough. And mixing it is almost a disservice to those rich historical traditions. I was always curious whether there is anything that I can find that is truly shared. And now, you know, like I said before, for a lot of people, celebrating the local elements of each tradition and uh, putting that in focus is all that's important. And I respect that too. And, and we should celebrate all of these things. But it just seems to me like in the 21st century, we really have to acknowledge that we also have some things in common. But these things are hidden underneath the surface. They are not, like, right there. So um, the way that the blues behaves is just so intricately uh, related to this reality that we call raga. When you, when you listen to Here Be Dragons and Isabella that you just released, Do you feel like there is like a, a natural evolution? Are they like siblings project? Are they cousins project? Are they uh, neighbors project? <laughs> How would you describe the, the, the evolution of the music between those two albums? Mm -hmm. Here Be Dragons was very much an album that was focused on the subject of fear. And I was trying to paint this picture where fear is the one thing that doesn't obey the laws of linear perspective. Uh, meaning, it's the one thing that doesn't get bigger when you move closer to it. Or smaller when you move away. And that's why I used this narrative with Filippo Bonoleschi, the father of linear perspective, that was on a pirate ship uh, on the way to find the dragons, but every time they went close, actually the dragons disappeared. And uh, those are the things that I was thinking about back then as a religious person, as a person that practices meditation and finds that to be true about fear rather than all the other things in the world. That was just something that I was trying to encapsulate in the music. And uh, Isabella is about love. So, uh, and specifically about Isabella, the person, So in a lot of ways, though, they couldn't be more different, right? Um, at the same time, they are played by the same band, and uh, they were composed by the same person, so I guess some things connect them. But I'm actually very proud of how different they are in, in, in a lot of ways. a very close second to, to silence. 
Silence is the best love language, I think. When you don't have to say anything, you know the person already knows. There's nothing you could say that would really explain it. I think that's the primary love language. And then uh, uh, a very distant second would be, uh, would be music. Even in music though, it's such a monumental task to think that you can possibly describe a person in melodies. Was it your goal with the album? Describe her? Portraiture was mm. part of the goal. Mm. A love letter, but also a portrait. Because a raga is a portrait, you know, and I was trying to describe her in some ways. The lion turtle is a portrait of her in the future. Isabella is a portrait of her, like, in the present, the main piece, and Love Song for the Rainy Season is actually a portrait of her that I composed 14 years ago before I knew her. But I know now that it was about her, <laughs> and I didn't know her, but I loved her already. And these are con like three portraits that sort of make the album. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it is a love language. Uh, but uh, it's also so challenging to think that you could possibly speak it, you know, to the person that you love the most. Does she recognize herself? I think, I think so. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. And do you feel like the band, the people you're playing this music with, yeah. need to know her to be able to uh, play that music? I don't think so. I think I mean they know her. Yeah. They they do know her, but uh, I mean they 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 all you know they probably like her better than they like me, but <laughs> uh, but I don't think that's uh, a necessity. I think that you know the the music kind of takes us uh, somewhere. I want to go back a little about what you were saying about heavy dragons and. Yeah. You mentioned the lion turtle as one of the the title of the the tracks of this album. Can we take a second to discuss the 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 place of fantastic creatures <laughs> in your in your universe uh, in your you know yeah uh, nature is important. Mm -hmm. uh, there was those beautiful trees on the cover of the Herbie Dragons. Mm. Here is this beautiful picture of sky reflecting in water and the forest yeah. and the dragons for the last one the lion turtle is that yeah. a, even a, like <laughs> a made-up animal that you created you're a city person you live in the mm. city you live in new york yeah how nature what is the place of nature in your life and in your music i live in the city but i dream about nature hmm. i think um and uh, when I had the big crisis of not being able to play straight ahead jazz anymore when I was in high school, I went to play in the field. And uh, next to my house there was this field and I just wanted to play there and that's where I started kind of my exploration. <laughs> Because it allows me to hear what the raga would sound on a specific moving bass. So if I were to compose in the Indian classical music context alone, I would compose on the saxophone or in my mind. But since I'm composing these ragas that I'm placing on a moving bass actually, which is different than the original context, but similar to the blues, again, that's exactly what the blues is, a raga on a moving bass. Uh, I need to hear what it's going to sound like with my left hand. So you basically had to introduce the band members to Raga and, and Indian music, did you? To an extent. I always tell them what the movements are and what the Raga is like, but I don't expect them to treat it with an Indian music treatment, you I know? See. 
and and that is I think really the good a good decision because that allows everyone to feel completely free and I think as a composer what you can't uh, do with the music is really not going to happen anyway you know the music needs to be this uh, seed that makes everyone you know inspired to do things uh, in a not necessarily in a certain way, but just that, like a seed, contains all of this information. And I try to just encode that in the composition. And then if Nitai wants to play something that is super sophisticated harmony over it, then he should, and he does. And that's, I think, the, the beauty of it. So talk to me about the band. You, you mentioned them uh, at the beginning of this interview, but talk to me about them. Nitai Ashkovitz, Petros Klampanis, and, and Jonathan Blake... They have very strong personalities. Mm. Um, they have very different backgrounds and vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell you actually something that my wife said to me one time after we listened to a different show that I will not name. But we went to see a concert and everyone in the band was great. But what she said to me after the show was that it just didn't um, come to anything that is larger than the sum of its parts. Each of the musicians individually was amazing, but it didn't make something that is larger than that. I mean, I think that uh, I have to credit Isabella with being able to say things in a remarkably straightforward way sometimes, that we would make me realize that I've been thinking about this for so many years but haven't been able to put it quite like that. Because what she said, that is music, actually. The part that is louder than the sum, that is what I would say is called music. Yeah. So I think it's not a bad idea to put people together that are different in the same group. Uh, and, and I think that we are different. So Nitai, like I said, is um, really the ability that he has to abstract things, to make them abstract, to take them to like a different realm. Uh, it just keeps astounding me. And I think that he just creates this layer in the music that is so full of imagination and so full of the sense of wonder um, that, you know, the band would absolutely not sound the same without him. And uh, same goes for Petros and Jonathan. With Petros, what I feel is happening is even more invisible because it's actually the way that he plays and how comfortable he is with silence, actually with not adding any unnecessary details, makes it possible for everyone else in the band to actually do whatever it is that they are doing. Because he is down there in the bass frequencies. If he were to do things differently, everything would sound different. And he's actually kind of like the, the silent poet at the, at, at the base of everything, and, and really defining the sound of the band. And uh, Jonathan is again a very different musician and obviously really comes from the straight ahead school and, uh, and swing very much defining his, his sound in the, in the most beautiful way. And, uh, you know, I think that when I just moved to New York, I didn't think of hiring a drummer like that necessarily because I was still thinking that Indian classical music is the primary factor and if anything, maybe I should hire a percussionist for this quartet and not even a, a person who plays a drum set. But the way that Jonathan plays and the life that he's able to breathe into the songs is just so remarkable and fits so well without me having necessarily anticipated it. Uh, I just love the fact that he's, uh, that he's in the band. So you know, like you said, we're all very different, but that's exactly what this music needs, I think.
what's your relationship with ECM? Um, how's your relationship with ECM? Did you listen to a lot of ECM albums before even considering uh, signing on, on this label? And, and what does it mean for you? And what does Manfred Eichel bring to uh, the table? Manfred is absolutely a genius. There's no doubt about that. And Manfred loves music. And he loves the truth. And for that, he's forever my ally. In this particular album, I can tell you very, uh, in a very real way that he gave me some piece of advice that was so valuable because um, this music is very personal, uh, very private, as he said it. Maybe every music is, but this one particularly so. And there's something about being in the studio and thinking about recording this for the whole world to hear. In a way, this music is for my wife. Everyone else gets to hear that as a favor, but it is for her, you know? So the process of recording it, there's something a bit odd about it because it's very personal. So it, it shouldn't be recorded in a sense. And um, I mentioned something about this to Manfred when we were in the studio and Manfred helped me remember that I don't need to do anything special to make it appropriate for recording. It should be just what it is. He said, keep it private. Just keep it private. And that's all. And when you go home, play it for your wife. And that's the album, you know, and, and that's actually what I did. And the fact that he had the the presence of spirit, it's an expression in Portuguese, I'm learning Portuguese, so I know it, <laughs> uh, to just say like a couple of words like that at the right time to put me in the right state of mind, I am really grateful for that. So, yeah, I appreciate having him in the studio for, for that reason. Um, actually, this is the only thing that I've ever done that I am truly happy with. So I, uh, I mean, this and marrying my wife. So I don't know if I would ever play like this again, <laughs> but I'm glad that I did once because uh, this is what I always wish that would happen to me to play once like that. Odetsur about his new ECM record, Isabella. Thank you for joining, choosing, and listening to our ECM podcast. I'm Caroline Fontagneux, and I look forward to sharing more music with you in the next episode. <laughs>